Hello everybody, how are you? This is Dr. Najib. Today we are going to talk about that how blood glucose is regulated within normal limit in human body. Right? Our main topic is that how normoglycemia is maintained in a healthy normal person. Right? Because what is diabetes? Diabetes is a group of metabolic disorders in which the common string is hyperglycemia due to either deficiency of insulin or due to reduced action of insulin, right? So before really we go into the de de details and depth of diabetes mellitus, let's discuss the very basic and foundation of the diabetes mellitus that normally in a healthy person, how blood glucose level is maintained in a narrow range. And why it is so important to keep the blood glucose in a normal range, right? So let's talk about what is the normal range. Normal range is, let's suppose this is your, I just make hypothetical diagram. And in this hypothetical diagram, blood glucose should be maintained somewhere between, yes. Normally, in a healthy person, blood glucose should stay, right? Should stay somewhere more than 60, right? And fasting blood sugar, fasting, fasting blood sugar should not go more than 100 milligrams per dl. Again, listen. In a normal healthy person, today our all discussion is about a healthy person. In a healthy person, Fasting blood sugar should not go above the 100 milligrams per dl, right? And minimum blood sugar which you are allowed to have is around 50 to 60 milligrams per dl. But once you, once you, once you take a carbo, carbohydrate rich meal, once you take carbohydrate rich meal, of course a lot of glucose is being absorbed from gastrointestinal system and in your blood, glucose levels start going up, right? Now, here it is very important to know that after two hours of, after two hours of taking the food, right? Or we should say within two hours of taking the food, glucose level controlling mechanisms should be so strong in a person that blood glucose level post prandially after two hours should not be more than 140 milligrams not more than 140 milligrams per 100 ml or dl right same here same here right this is what yes it is not fasting once you have taken the food, once you have taken the food, blood sugar will start going up and then insulin and other factors will come into play and they will start controlling the blood sugar level. So blood, blood glucose level should not produce a very strong spike in the blood, right? Because I will tell you later that if blood glucose level goes too high in the blood, it is very dangerous for us, right? So what happens that post prandially, two hours post prandially, post prandial, after food, your blood glucose should be, should not be more than 140. 140 milligrams. And once you take food, right, before two hours, blood glucose might jump above that. Again, listen very carefully. If I, if, if I wake up and I'm in a fasting state, my blood sugar should not be more than 100 and not less than 60, right? Okay, this is fasting blood sugar. Then I take carbohydrate rich meal. If I take carbohydrate rich meal, my blood glucose after two hours should be controlled within 140 milligrams per dl. But during that, before two hours, it might jump up, but it is still not allowed 
to go more than more than 200 milligrams per dl and this is also called random blood glucose level right so in a way we can say that these are four important figures you should remember right again in a fasting state blood glucose should be somewhere between 60 to 100 after taking the food and passing of the two hours your blood, blood sugar level should not be more than 140 and randomly sometimes you have just taken the food just two hours have not passed maybe just 20 minutes are passed or 40 minutes are passed and a lot of blood glucose is absorbing maximum level you are allowed to have is 200, 200 milligram per dl now this is within normal range right from here up to here it is normal range above it there is a trouble if blood glucose shoot above these values if fasting blood glucose is more than 100 or 2 hour postprandial blood glucose is more than 140 milligram per dl or random blood glucose level is more than 200 milligram per dl if it goes more than that it is dangerous it is dangerous, dangerous. And I will tell you that what are the dangers. Blood glucose become toxic. If blood glucose level become more than normal, then it become toxic. I will explain what toxicity it produces. In the same way, if blood glucose falls below that, even that is also dangerous. That is also dangerous right now we have to discuss after discussing this now there are three questions number one why it is so important to keep the blood glucose normal why to keep it normal number two if blood glucose goes above the normal limits right what happens in hyperglycemia hyper glycemia what are the dangers why the glucose which we love so much become toxic substance it, it must be a question then if blood glucose falls below 60 or 50 milligram per dl again there is a question what is the question why it is dangerous What are the dangers of? It means we have to talk about three things first of all before we talk about the regulation of blood glucose. We'll talk later that re regulation of blood glucose within these limits. There are many substances which play their role. Encretins are there, insulin is there, and then other su substances related with insulin should be discussed. Then there are substances we don't allow the blood glucose to fall below, right? These substances are glucagon, epinephrine, norepinephrine, cortisol, and growth hormone. But I will go to discuss these substances or hormones later in detail. First, I want to answer this question that why we need normal level of blood glucose? Why blood glucose become toxic above the normal range? And why it becomes like a lost precious substance below the normal range? First of all, normal range. Why we need blood glucose in a limited level? You can say we talk about two levels that fast in 100 and postprandially 140. One for, it should be below 140 milligram per dl. Fasting should be uh, below 100. Now, this narrow range is mostly maintained. What is, why it is so? The reason being that in our body there are some very important organs very very important organs which live solely on glucose their metabolism mainly depends on glucose there are some very important organs right which cannot use fatty acids which cannot store the glucose in form of glycogen in enough amount and these organ need continuous 
supply of glucose. If glucose is too low, those organs are in trouble. If glucose is too high, some other organs are in trouble. So first of all, what are the organs in our body for which we need to maintain the blood glucose level in normal range? Answer is, first of all, your central nervous system. Yes, and neurons. Neurons, brain, it needs constant supply of glucose. Central nervous system needs constant supply of glucose. Neurons needs constant supply of glucose. And they need a good amount of glucose. You know, neurons have a lot of sodium, potassium, ATPases, and they have a lot of channels, and so and though a lot of ionic changes are coming into that, the action potentials are going on. So for all these things, they have to keep their metabolism active. And they need a constant supply of glucose. Again, I will repeat, my central nervous system, hopefully yours is also the same, right? We need constant supply of glucose. Why? Multiple reasons. Number one, glucose can easily cross the blood-brain barrier, right? Glucose can easily cross blood-brain barrier. Central nervous system cannot use the fatty acid as energy. Why central, system, central nervous system cannot use fatty acids as energy, very simple reason, yes, the reason is that fatty acids, which we call it free fatty acid, they are really not free. As we say, married women are free, but actually they are not free. In the same way, free fatty acids are not free, free fatty acids are st sticking with the albumin and pre-albumin. Free fatty acids in the blood are not free, they are attached with Albumin and every albumin has luckily up to 8 to 10 fatty acids. And as albumin cannot cross the blood brain barrier, so fatty acids cannot also cross the blood brain barrier. And if both of them cannot cross the blood brain barrier, it means that fatty acid, which is one of the common fuel in our circulatory system for many organs, is useless for central nervous system. Right? So, this is one thing. Number two. Central nervous system can use an other nutrient which is called ketone. But normally ketone body, body level in the blood is very low. And if they become very high, central and glucose is, glucose is not there enough, central nervous system can use ketone as energy source but with difficulty. So most efficient and most preferred fuel of central nervous system is your glucose and you need to maintain your glucose level within the normal uh, range for optimal functioning of central nervous system. Is that clear? Number one organ, number two organ is, yes, here is your beautiful eyes and here is retina. Here is retina. Retinal epithelium, retina, that also solely depends on glucose. glucose, right? Central nervous system mainly uses glucose or only uses glucose as a preferred source. In the same way, retina, retina can also use only glucose, retinal and central nervous system. Actually, I write down central nervous system because there's something going down and someone misunderstand what I have drawn. So this is central nervous system. Then there's one more organ. Yes, something very important in our body which require glucose, which depends on glucose, which uses glucose as preferred fuel. Yes, who is going to tell me? Yes, you guys. There is another substance. Yes. Kidney? No, kidney, is, kidney can use fatty acid. Yes. Germinal epithelium. Germinal epithelium in, in your testes or in your ovaries. Germinal epithelium. Germinal epithelium which lead to gametogenesis. Right? It may be present in, of course, in your, in your gonads. Never under underestimate the powers of germinal epithelium, you know. 
Why? Because these are our genitalia. This is the only organ in our body, genitalia, which can defeat the death. These are the only organs in our body which can defeat the death. With the time we get old, our body becomes wasted. But if we have produced our kids, of course, our gen genitalia must have played some role. And germinal epithelium must have produced, what is this? Gametogenesis, in which meiosis should have occurred. And then sperms or ova should be produced, right? This is the sperm or ova which can we carry our DNA to the next generation. And when we are dead, our DNA is still living in our children and then grandchildren and so and so forth. So genitalia are very important. Never underestimate their, their power. And don't be too ashamed of the genitalia. Be proud of that if your genitalia are working good, that then you can defeat the death by producing the kids and your path by passing your DNA to the next generation before you die. But the problem is, even this germinal epithelium in the genitalia, this germinal epithelium, it is mainly dependent on glucose. Uh, uh, if I want to be more specific, glucose is its preferred what? Fuel. So central nervous system, retina, germinal epithelium, these are the minimum three organs all good doctors should know that these organs are dependent on the glucose and we have to keep the normal supply of glucose to them. Is that right? This is the main reason why we need glucose normal supply. And these tissues, again I will repeat, central nervous system or retina or German epithelium. It is German or germinal? Germinal. Germinal, okay, it is not German. Okay, germinal epithelium, these three organs use glucose as preferred fuel and we have to maintain reasonable glucose levels in the blood. Now, we come to the real trouble. The real trouble is, if glucose level is more than normal, if there is hyperglycemia, if there is hyperglycemia, why it is dangerous? Apparently, if we have more glucose, our brain should be more happy. Is that right? Apparently, our retina should be happy. And even your or mine germinal epithelium should be super happy. But there is a problem. Moderation is the beauty of life. Anything too, too much or too less, both is bad. When glucose becomes more than normal, that becomes toxic substance in our body, right? So let me explain first that when glucose becomes more than normal, what happens? Let's come over this side. When glucose becomes too much, for example, glucose is not uh, 140 milligram or 120 milligram, right, uh, per DL. Let's suppose there's an unfortunate person in which blood glucose is not being regulated well and his blood glucose level is, let's suppose, 500 milligrams per DL. For example, there is a person in which blood glucose regulatory mechanisms are not working well and when this person takes carbohydrate rich meal, his blood glucose level goes too high. If his blood le glucose level becomes too high, right, what are the problems? Number one is, all extracellular fluid will become hyperosmotic. What will happen? That your extra, extracellular fluid, extracellular fluid will become, yes, hyperosmotic. Right now, here are the cells, right, and in between here is glucose and extracellular fluid. If there is too much glucose and it is hyperosmotic, it will suck the fluid out of the cells and many tissues will dysfunction and you will feel fatigued. Again, I am repeating, if blood glucose level really goes too much high, generally what happens in the body, generally speaking, that this hyperosmotic 
extracellular fluid is that right that will suck the water out of cells and cells become somewhat dehydrated and these dehydrated cells don't perform optimally don't perform optim optimally so this is one problem which occurs due to hyperglycemia all over the body in all tissues is that right second is second is we should see the effects of hyperglycemia especially on the kidney especially on the kidney what happens in the kidney let's suppose here is your very beautiful what is it kidney and of course you have two kidneys and every kidney you have about 1.2 million nephrons as i mentioned in every lecture i mentioned you are millionaire as far as nephrons are concerned but unfortunately they don't produce dollars they just produce urine right so you have millions of nephrons now in every kidney you have 1.2 million nephrons now let me see that how nephrons mal malfunction their function is disturbed when there is too much glucose in the blood right let's suppose here is one nephron and this nephron i draw, draw out i bring it out and we see what happens there this is bowman's capsule proximal convoluted tubule here is loop of henle descending part then ascending part then distal ascending part and then there is distal convoluted tubule and collecting tubules and many collecting tubules come together and eventually they make collecting ducts and here is your urine drop urine is being produced right now when your blood glucose level is very high when your blood glucose level is very very high then what will happen that blood vessels afferent arterioles will bring more glucose to the capillaries of glomeruli right and normally what happen glucose is freely permeable glucose is freely permeable so in normal healthy person glucose filters from the glomeruli into the nephron and in normal person most of this glucose is reabsorbed from here back to the back to the blood there are special mechanisms in proximal convoluted tubules right and there are many mechanism one of them is sodium glucose co linked sodium sodium glucose linked transporters they take take glucose from here right and they will take within the cell and in the cell basolateral side this is the apical side of the membrane which is facing to the lumen and this is the basolateral side of the membrane right now these uh, special type of glucose transporters are present only on apical side of the membrane and then there are special channels right these are called glucose transporters type 2 they are present on basolateral side so whatever glucose enters it will through this pass out right back to the blood so practically if your glucose is within normal range now listen carefully practically if your blood glucose level is within normal range then most of the glucose which is filtered which we call it filtered load of glucose most of it is reabsorbed most of it is recaptured it is reclaimed by the proximal convoluted tubular cells back to the blood right so you can say if you are somehow having some special type of tongue you can taste here it is sweet but as you go forward sweet sweetness become less because most of the glucose is 
gone back to the blood and normally we don't allow any significant amount of glucose to be lost into urine in most of the people am i clear now if your bl uh, blood glucose level goes pathologically high if blood glucose level goes very high right then what happen if there is more glucose in the blood as i told you 500 mg per dl then fil filtered amount of glucose will be more we say there will be very heavy filtered load of glucose and all these reabsorption mechanism will be overwhelmed they will be overwhelmed they will be not able to reabsorb all of the glucose and if there is too much glucose coming here then some of more glucose comes more absorbed more glucose comes more reabsorbed but at a level when glucose goes beyond the normal range so much glucose arrives here that some of it cannot be reabsorbed and glucose start yes some of the glucose was not recaptured or reclaimed or reabsorbed so this glucose will pass to the more distal part of what is this nephron and this glucose will appear into urine this glucose will appear into urine so what will happen like glucose urea or glycosuria will start but this is not the only problem of course this is one problem that when blood glucose level goes very high not only all excess cellular fluid in the body become what hyperosmotic and pulls the water out of the most of the cells of the most of the tissues and uh, cells under a dehydrated condition malfunction there are not these are general problem in the body special problem comes when a high amount of glucose is going being filtered into nephron and if nephron cannot reabsorb all of it right glucose start appearing into urine now when you are losing glucose into urine actually you are losing a form of energy in the urine you are losing calories into urine this is one problem but it produces another problem that this glucose which is moving forward it will drag the water with it it will pull the water with it what happens most of the glucose is reabsorbed here and lot of water is also 60 to 70% of the water is also reabsorbed here right but if glucose is not being absorbed and it is moving forward it will pull the water with it then more than normal amount of water will be pulled in the lumen along with the glucose due to its osmotic effect and more water will appear into urine and then you will pass excessive amount of urine right if and every if, if per day in 24 hour if your urine amount become more than 3 liter we say you have started polyuria now it means one problem was that there was glycosuria number two was that this glucose was pulling lot of what water. water with it because it was pulling lot of water with it so it was also producing some sort of diuresis what it was producing diuresis, diuresis. of course this diuresis is also producing dehydration in the body if you don't control and if body is getting dehydrated of course then your which center thirst center in in hypothalamus will be activated and and when those thirst center are activated you will feel more thirsty and if water is available you will take more water we say with polyuria and with polyuria you have polydipsia and if lot of calories are being lost you will lose the weight and even weight loss can occur and you will feel more hungry due to loss of calories and there may be polyphagia is that right so multiple problems are occurring there that number one has normal blood glucose is high, very high hyperglycemia the glucose filtered into nephron is too high right then this high amount of high load of glucose cannot be reabsorbed by the proximal convoluted tubules because it is more than the capacity of the proximal convoluted tubule to reabsorb when it becomes more than that lot of glucose appears into urine and that produces glycosuria and this glycosuria 
what this glycosuria is doing with this osmotic effect it drags excessive amount of water with it it does not allow the nephron to reabsorb the water properly so flow of water also increases flow of water through the tube also increases when flow of the water increases we say that there is diuresis but with this rapid flow of the fluid produces one more problem and that is very serious problem this rapid flow of the fluid through the nephron lumen produces one more problem normally what happens first we compare normal then we talk of normal normally when there is normal level normal glucose in blood normal level of glucose is filtered most of the glucose is reabsorbed along with that lot of water is reabsorbed and fluid is moving here slowly or fastly slowly when fluid is moving slowly then what happens that cells of the epithelium cells of the epithelium of what is this nephron in different part of the nephron right those cells are able to when water is when glucose level is normal most of the glucose reabsorb most of the water reabsorbs right then less water is left normally in the lumen which is moving very gradually inside the nephron and when this fluid is moving very gradually these cells have less time or more time to work on the fluid more time because water is flowing slowly if water is flu uh, moving slowly then the processing of luminal fluid become more effective by the nephron cells and electrolytes are properly reabsorbed and excreted due to that reason electrolyte balance is maintained well in the blood but now imagine abnormality person with high glucose level in the blood high glucose load here lot of glucose is reabsorbed but still lot more is going into urine glycosuria is produced then there is a osmotic effect of this glucose so what happened lot of water is also going when glucose followed by water with osmotic effect when rapidly passing what will happen that chances of epithelial cell of nephron to work on fluid and electrolyte are less is that right so due to this rapid flow induced by the osmotic effect of the glucose epithelial cells are unable to work properly to reabsorb the what is that electrolytes or to secrete certain electrolytes that will lead to electrolyte imbalance so not only blood glucose problem is there not only there is glucose urea not only there is diuresis there is electrolyte imbalance imbalance is also imbalance is also there you can just imagine that as if the there are lot of proteins here which are capturing the electrolytes you imagine those proteins are like mon monkeys those monkeys are capturing what electrolytes right water is going and electrolytes are like mangoes electrolytes are like mangoes if water is going electrolytes mean mangoes are going and water is going slowly and monkeys are catching the mangoes and enjoying but if water suddenly become very fast can mangoes be catch caught no. not so monkey will try to catch but due to rapid flow electrolytes will be dragged very rapidly and appear into urine so blood electrolyte balance or extracellular electrolyte balance will be disturbed too now you understand that very high blood glucose level is not good why it is not good overall in the body it produces hyperosmotic extracellular fluid and that sucks the water or pulls the water out of the cells in most tissues and the relatively dehydrated cells don't work optimally secondly we must know when blood glucose level is very high what are the effects on the kidney when blood glucose level is high 
glucose load, load on the kidney is high kidney epithelium cannot reabsorb most of the glucose glucose appear into urine glucosuria that glucose drag the pull the water with it what is that diuresis or polyuria when water more water is passing through the lumen it takes faster flow and this fast flow of the fluid does not allow the epithelial cell to properly recapture certain electrolyte and electrolyte maintenance in the body is also disturbed right now these are some effect of unfortunately some effect of hyperglycemia these are only some effects then there are long term effect if the mechanism in your body which controls the blood glucose and maintains it within normal limit if those mechanisms are disturbed as it happens in diabetes mellitus if those mechanisms are disturbed not only polyuria or polydipsia or polyphagia or electrolyte imbalance occurs if this type of problem is long term again i will repeat if you have a tendency to have hyperglycemia if you have a tendency to have hyperglycemia chronically for long time then long term complications occur then long term complications occur we have discussed in the previous lecture we have discussed in the previous lecture that if for okay let's come here long term complication can be due to hyperglycemic peaks long long term complications due to hyperglycemia what happens that if hyperglycemia now i'm going to draw a blood vessel here this is a blood vessel and this is your what is this endothelium, endothelium. these are your endothelial cells now if blood glucose levels become very high right they damage glucose itself is directly toxic to endothelial cells glucose can directly high high level of glucose can directly damage the cells with every hyperglycemic peak these cells become dehydrated number 1 number 2 high level of glucose for long time for months and years will react with certain proteins here and produce glycation products what are glycation products that there is a certain protein different proteins here cellular or extracellular glucose react with those proteins and when glucose react with those protein that produces glycated product we call them those products are called advanced glycation and products and products so in chronic cases where you have a long term term tendency to develop hyperglycemia again and again and again right because glucose hyperglycemia controlling factors in your blood are not working well and after every meal glucose goes beyond the normal limits right there is chronic insult to your endothelium right it means now this disease is converting not only hyperosmotic disease it is converting into vascular disease now it is becoming vascular disease because it is damaging the endothelium when it is dam damaging the endothelium and basement membrane under the endothelium basement membrane under the endothelium and with this age products right advanced glycation and products these age products right they produce lot of damage here for example they can produce cytokines they can force the cells here to produce growth factor they can force lot of production of this abnormal glycated proteins to which glucose is sticking they become malfunctional so they as i mentioned that more cytokines are produced here more growth factors are produced here more you can say reactive oxygen species is produced here right more proliferation of the smooth cells and more deposition of the extracellular fluid extra 
extra uh, you can say collagen and such substances are deposited here which are abnormal and eventually that may lead to the formation of atheromas atheroma atherosclerotic disease will come especially in large vessels so we say that long term long term hyperglycemia may lead to macro vascular complications or diseases that large and medium sized vessels right they, they are damaged so much that they develop lot of atheromatous plaques and in these diabetic patients the atheromas or atherosclerotic diseases developing earlier than the normal population developing more widely and atheromas are more severe and dangerous and unstable you are getting it again i am repeating actually now i am trying to tell you something else that chronic damage by the glucose and damage to the endothelium and eventually production of lot of advanced glycation end products convert the whole system into inflammatory disease of the vessels right because they are cytokines because there are growth factors because there are infiltration of neutrophils and macrophages and lymphocytes because there are lot of proteases released there because local cells are proliferating too much so all this lead to a macrovascular disease which appears pathologically as widespread very aggressive rapidly developing right and dangerous atherosclerotic disease and this atherosclerotic disease clinically manifest in which vessel specially it produces coronary artery disease myocardial infarction can is more common of course you can talk about cerebrovascular disease right there are more what are these in central nervous system arteries damage which may lead to at, uh, ischemic stroke most commonly but hemorrhage can occur then atheromas can develop in your limbs peripheral. right peripheral arteries peripheral yes arteries atherosclerotic disease especially ischemia and uh, this type of ischemia is very common in the lower limb which with added with the neuropathy and infections and uh, vascular uh, disease leading to ischemia may necessitate at some advanced stage unfortunately limb amputation is the right diabetic foot then not only this one vessel usually student forget the vessel which is going to the kidney we call it reno vascular disease reno vascular disease this reno vascular disease is actually renal arteries not talking about the glomerular disease and other disease related within the kidney right so atheromas may develop there and that may lead to what happen reduce blood flow to the kidney so this in this way high glucose level lead to mac macrovascular diseases and in some organ it loves to produce micro vascular diseases as i mentioned in previous lecture that the target of the microvascular diseases that again high glucose has damaged the basement membranes and those basement membrane in certain organs smaller vessel certain organ smaller vessel basement membranes become very thick but cracky they develop multiple cracks they develop multiple pores they develop multiple you can say holes and those again in those organs in which microvasculature is disturbed and microvascular disease occur you should remember retina retinopathy retinopathy then you can remember yes neuropathy different types of neuropathies right which may be autonomic neuropathy or somatic neuropathy somatic neuropathy may be motor neuropathy or sensory neuropathy the sensory neuropathy may be uh, symmetrical or asymmetrical we will have a full lecture on neuropathy diabetic neuropathies are very important we'll talk in detail
right? So for a while you just believe me that uh, diabetes leads to microvascular neuropathy, right? Small vessels. Then in the kidney, nephropathy, small vessels in the kidney, especially we can talk about vessels in the glomeruli, capillary system that is damaged by the diabetes. So nephropathy. With this, so what we see that it is very important to keep the blood glucose level in normal limit. If blood glucose level go beyond the normal limit and above the normal limit, it can produce generalized dehydration in the body, right? And hyperosmotic extracellular fluid. It can lead to the polyuria, polydips, and of course, then diuresis, and then electrolyte loss and electrolyte imbalance in the blood. Then in the long run, it can produce macrovascular disease, it can produce microvascular disease and many more complications, right? For example, it can produce cataract, then it can lead to more infections. In the previous lecture, I explained that why hyperglycemia lead to ineffective, you can say, immune system and how neutrophils and uh, macrophages are drunk with high, what is that, glucose and they don't perform well. and I have explained it in the previous lecture, the more infections. So it means that when blood glucose levels are very high, acutely or chronically, that produces lot of dysfunction in our vascular system and other systems. Is it clear? Yes. Now I want to talk about, okay, this is understood clearly that we should not allow the blood glucose level to go beyond a certain limit. It means our body must have very powerful mechanism to prevent hyperglycemia. We will talk about that when we talk about insulin and related substances. We must have very, very powerful mechanism that once we eat the food, after that there is a tendency to reabsorb lot of glucose and that glucose if not immediately stored, right, that may produce spike, hyperglycemic spikes. And these repeated hyperglycemic spikes after every food can damage our body. So there are very strong mechanisms to, to blunt those spikes of glucose, right? We'll talk that in insulin. Now we come to the other question that why it's so why it is so important that blood glucose level should not fall beyond a certain limit. This is also a question. Why we should keep our blood glucose level around 50 to 60 milligram per dl? For example, if my blood glucose level become 40, what's bad in that? Answer is, I have already given that there are some tissues which mainly depend only on glucose. What were those tissues? Your central nervous system, your retina and your very, very sacred, what is that? Germinal, Germinal epithelium, right? And RBCs even love to use glucose preferentially, right? So these are basically glucose using tissue. I will talk mainly that let's suppose due to some reason I've missed my food, right? Regular time and my fasting become prolonged. Now my central nervous system is using glucose continuously and heavily. So eventually blood glucose levels will start falling. Now blood glucose levels when they are falling they should not be allowed to fall beyond a certain limit because if they fall beyond a certain limit we will be in troubles i will tell you what are the troubles but before th that i tell you what are the characters which we say anti fall characters anti fall characters these are glucagon when glucose is gone glucagon comes and it supports the glucose level then it has its friends the gang of glucagon as a group, they are called counter-regulatory hormones, right? They try to support here. So there is glucagon here, glucagon here, which is supporting the glucose upward, right? Then I will mention with glucagon, yes, what are the other friends? Epinephrine and norepinephrine, epinephrine and norepinephrine. Then there is uh, more substances which come to help to glucagon to maintain the blood glucose level so that it is 
your brain keep on getting the supply of glucose as long as possible. So here another friend is coming into play and what is that? Cortisol. Cortisol. And then there is one more growth hormone. hormone. Even a little role like baby role is played by thyroxine. So substances which don't allow the glucose to go up. The most important is insulin. Most important is insulin. insulin. So we can say insulin is anti-rise factor. But there are anti-fall also many factors. All of them, we will see later in detail, have certain mechanisms by which they support the blood glucose level. If you are not eating, they try their best that blood glucose level should remain within normal limits and should not fall too much. And during that, these gang, gangs, gang of four, okay, I should remove this. These counter-regulatory hormone while maintaining the blood glucose levels by different mechanisms which I will explain later while maintaining they arrange the alternative fuels like ketone bodies for central nervous system. They arrange the alternative fuel. But for a while we will just focus on that in a person he was in fasted state and he couldn't get to eat anything right. So what will happen? that glucose will progressively fall. If someone has these mechanisms not functioning well or fasting goes into starvation and it becomes so prolonged that glucose is really down, your body will react very ang angrily, especially your, yes, especially your central nervous system. Because when central nervous system is not getting its favorite candies, what are the favorite candies? glucose when central nervous system is not getting its favorite what fuel glucose right it is not happy central nervous system it is angry central nervous system it is uh, you can say strong or weak? weak weak so we say neurologically person will develop signs and symptoms of glycopenia glycopenia mean less glucose or we call it glycopenic neuro, neurological manifestations glycopenic neurological manifestation for example the people who develop hypoglycemia they have some problems related with central nervous system for example first of all their behavior become, becomes altered altered behavior this is specially recognized in diabetic patient if they go into hypoglycemia this is specially recognized by their close friends and close family member that person's behavior is a little abnormal but as glucose goes down it keep on bringing more and more worrisome complications like person become irritable person become irritable then there will be yes confusional state what is confusion by the way? Yes, when you see a beautiful girl, you become confused. What is confusion? What is confusion? You don't know confusion, yes. Uh, the people who are in hypoglycemia, they cannot uh, recognize the food oriented in time. Yes, anyone who is not well oriented, very good. Anyone who is not well oriented in time, place and person. Don't tell, tell time, space and person. We are not in space. If we are not clear about time, that it is morning or evening or night or what day, or time, place, we are not sure we are in hospital or we are in ambulance or we are in the home or we are in the kitchen or we are in the washroom, we are confused. Or time, place and person, we don't know people who are visiting us, their doctor or nurses or our beloved relatives or uh, friends. When we are not able to process these things, our environment clearly, right? When, what happens? What is confusion? Confusion is, yes, when you are not well oriented in time, place and person. So what happens when central nervous system is getting less glucose, person develop confusional problem and sometimes this is very 
sad situation. Sometimes confusion and irritability, there's confusion and at the top there's irritability. Both things together actually produce a very dangerous combination and that combination is yes, hyperactive, hyper excited, confusional state which is called delirium. What is that called? Delirium. delirium. So actually hypoglycemia can produce even delirium. What is delirium? That person become highly confused and with that confusion he is not drowsy, he is not slow, he become very active and angry and may start doing the things which are very unpleasant, right? So what is happening? Your central nervous system is not getting its beloved favorite candies, glucose, glucose has gone too low, right? So central nervous system neurons are malfunctioning and during this malfunction, what is happening? Behavioral changes are there, irritability is there, confusion is there, delirium is there, even seizures can be there. Seizures can be there and coma and in extreme cases, very, very rare cases, it may lead to death, right? Then these are neurological, yes, manifestation of glycopenic, what? Central nervous system. But another system can occurs, what happens? When your blood glucose goes down, there are glucose meters present in your hypothalamus. We call them glucose sensing cells. In the hypothalamus, in the hypothalamus, there are special group of cells which are able to, yes, estimate blood glucose level. And if those cells become too active, when blood glucose level goes too down, those cells which are called glucose sensors, what are they called? glucose sensors, they activate the sympathetic nervous system, they do many things, one of them is autonomic dysfunction, sympathetic overflow, even in some people parasympathetic overflow, right, again I am repeating, these are called autonomic manifestation of hypoglycemia, what are these called, these are called autonomic manifestations of hypoglycemia. And what, what are these autonomic manifestations? These are neurological manifestation, but due to autonomic dysfunction, right? And this autonomic dysfunction, it will lead to, yes, second group of problems here. I should show here. This is hypothalamus. Here is your beautiful pituitary, right? In the hypothalamus glucose sensor actually sense that blood glucose level is very low and very near the glucose sensing cells, there are autonomic centers, right? Same in the hypothalamus. Those autonomic centers are abnormally disturbed. And when those autonomic sensors are disturbed, that will lead to, yes, that will lead to adrenergic problems, hyperadrenergic, increased epinephrine, norepinephrine in the body. We call it adre. Energic problems and it can lead to cholinergic problems due to dysfunction of parasympathetic nervous system. More many more uh, pronounced are adrenergic. What are adrenergic? When adrenergic system is over functioning, that may lead to yes, tremors, that will lead to palpitations, palpitations. Right? What is palpitation? Yes, my friend. When you, someone palpates your heart, that is palpitation. What is palpitation? Being aware of one's own heartbeat. Okay, he is saying that when you are aware of your heartbeat, that is palpitation. Maybe in literature, he, he is right. But in medical terms, we say unpleasant awareness of your cardiac activity. For example, if you are with your partner and you are very happy and you develop palpitations, you don't go to the doctor, or do you? And there are some other physiological activities when you are performing, your heart rate goes up. You don't say I'm having palpitation and uh, jump out of the bed and go to the cardiologist, no. The pleasant awareness of your cardiac activity is not 
palpitation in medical terms maybe in literature actually when you are having unpleasant awareness of cardiac activity either you feel heart is thumping against your chest or you perceive some mist what beats right so when cardiac activity is perceived as abnormal right we call it in medical terms palpitations so what happens when adrenergic activity comes that will lead to palpitation because adrenergic activity adrenergic sympathetic system norepinephrine and epinephrine norepinephrine comes from coming from the nerve endings and epinephrine coming from the adrenal medulla when they act on the heart they lead to positive chronotropic action heart rate increases they lead to positive inotropic action contraction of the heart increases even they lead to positive dromotropic action increase conduction in the heart conduction in the conduction velocity in the heart so what i'm saying that these adrenergic drugs can produce positive chronotropic action heart rate become more they lead to positive inotropic action the strength of contraction strength of contraction become more degree of strength of contraction by myocardium become more this is what every doctor knows then there are good doctors they know that when conduction pathway especially av node when, when it start conducting fast under the adrenergic influence this is called positive dromotropic action what is it called positive dromotropic action then if adrenaline become too much many cell myocardial cell they become hyper excitable and when they become pathologically hyper excitable and have a tendency to produce arrhythmias we say there's positive bathmotropic action should i write it okay i, I will write it here these five things positive chronotropic action heart rate goes up chronotropic then positive inotropic action mean increase strength of strength of contraction then i said increase conduction in the heart that is positive dromotropic action dromotropic action dromotropic action then there is the increased excitability increased abnormal excitability increased for example if s node is having normal excitability that is of course natural but if myocardial cells develop under the adrenergic influence what increased increased abnormal excitability which increases the risk for arrhythmias we say there is positive bathmotropic action it has nothing to do with the bath bathmotropic action right and if you are look one thing is how strongly you contract that is inotropic action but how rapidly you contract right that is the velocity of contraction that is called kinotropic action that is called linotropic action so actually this adrenergic flow leads to all these things over adrenergic flow on the heart and all these things some of these things like fast heart rate or strong contraction of the heart or heart going out of the rhythm all these things can manifest as palpitation as unpleasant awareness of the cardiac activity right along with that there are tremors there are palpitations and of course one of the very common thing which is related with the adrenergic overflow and that is anxiety that is anxiety so this person who is hypoglycemic will develop develop tremors and palpitations and become anxious then he might develop some cholinergic problems he might develop some cholinergic overflow problems now what could be the cholinergic overflow problems that may lead to sweating that may lead to hunger and paresthesias sweating you know your sweat glands they are supplied by the cholinergic nerves neurons right so there will be increased sweating 
right then with that what what else could be there yes ha huh? increase hunger now you understand hungry man is an angry man because he is too hungry glucose level is down sympathetic overflow is there sympathetic overflow is producing excitability and anxiety at the top uh, he is hung he is feeling hungry and anxious angry and then with that paresthesias paras thesias pain abnormal sensations in the body for example you may find hypoparesthesias where there are reduced sensations or there may be hyper sensations which are called hyperparesthesia so paresthesias may be over sensitivity like in the skin pins and needle or under sensitivity when some part of the body become numb right this might occur in cholinergic disturbance too right now this is what we have seen i will just rapidly rapidly summarize it up to now what we have discussed i know we have discussed in detail but it is important clinically what number 1 what is normal blood glucose level we talked about fasting blood glucose level should not be more than 100 mg per dl then we said 2 hour postprandial blood glucose level should not be more than 140 mg per dl and random blood glucose level should not be more than 200 mg per dl but if anti rise factors are not working well like insulin if it is not working well then blood glucose level goes up and if blood glucose level goes up hyperglycemic complications will occur right now normally which three tissues are dependent on glucose only central nervous system retina germinal epithelium of the gonads and some people want to talk specially about rbcs right okay then we can come to when glucose level goes up what are the problems very briefly number 1 when there's too much glucose in your body in excess cell of fluid i excess cell of fluid become hyperosmotic it sucks the water out of the cells cells become relatively dehydrated we call it cellular dehydration and that lead to cellular dysfunction and this high glucose load which appears into you can say bowman space and the nephron tubules the nephrons are unable to reabsorb all glucose lot of glucose is lost in urine producing the loss of calories uh, producing uh, weight loss or polyphagia right when glucose level is being lost with that it is also leading to uh, pulling lot of water due to osmosis and poly uh, that is producing diuresis of polyuria and when glucose is lot of glucose is passing through the lumen without being absorbed it is pulling the water with it the rate of flow of the luminal fluid becomes so fast that luminal fluid cannot be processed well by the nephron cells or you can say epithelial cells of the nephron and what happens that electrolyte balance cannot be maintained by the kidney and electrolyte imbalance will occur and if hyperglycemia occurs repeatedly and again and again and there is chronic tendency then advanced glycation and products will produce and they will produce lot of dysfunction in the body we'll discuss that detail in uh, future lectures but briefly i'm saying that these products will produce semi inflammatory situation right and specially they will produce macrovascular diseases and advanced atherosclerotic disease and its manifestation and microvascular diseases like retinopathy and and nephropathy and neuropathy right and with that some other complications like infections or cataracts or diabetic foot is very important we will have a full lecture on that not right now so the due to this reason we should not allow the blood glucose to go above the normal limits then why we don't allow the blood glucose go below the normal limits again the story is the same that brain needs continuous supply of the glucose so we have to support the glucose level at least a certain minimum level like 50 to 60 mg per dl if glucose level become less than that then central nervous system will become glycopenic it will develop develop deficiency of 
glucose and that glycopenic effect that glycopenic effect will produce uh, a lot of manifestations by the central nervous system and abnormal outflow of the autonomic nervous system central nervous system will dysfunction due to very low glucose and that might lead to behavioral changes irritability confusional state delirious delirious situations even seizures coma and death rarely uh, death occurs or because glucose sensing cells are sensing that glucose level is very low they stimulate the sympathetic nervous system and sometimes even parasympathetic system also too much so adrenergic symptoms will appear in the body and hyperadrenergic system and hypercholinergic system hyperadrenergic system commonly you will develop the tremors you will develop the palpitations and you might develop the anxiety, anxiety. and when cholinergic overflow occur that might lead to what kind of problems sweating. yes that will lead to excessive sweating that may lead to you can say paresthesias and that may lead to hunger right now we will take a break and after that we will continue this lecture is that right and after that after the break we are go going to study a very important thing that is anti rise factors we'll talk about insulin and its friends after the break we'll talk about insulin and its friends like incret what is the role of incretins in releasing high amount of insulin when glucose is taken orally what are incretins right how insulin is produced and released what are c peptides and amylin which are co secreted with insulin and what is their importance that we'll talk about in the after the break and then we'll have a little more break again and then we'll talk about anti fall factors we'll talk that how glucagon works epinephrine works norepinephrine works cortisol and hormo growth hormone all of them work together to and try their best to keep the blood glucose level within normal range and don't allow too much until alternative fuel like ketones are arranged in the body ketogenesis occur okay class dismiss for a while thank you